Well, welcome everyone. Um, I hope you've been having a, a terrific conference and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be with you here uh, for EduLearn 2021. Uh, my name is Justin Reich and I'm a faculty member at MIT uh, where I run a lab called the Teaching Systems Lab where we aspire to design, implement, and research the future of how teachers learn. Um, and I'm excited uh, this afternoon to share with you some ideas from a book that was published uh, earlier this academic year, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education. Um, you know, for the past two decades, we in the education field have heard uh, a series of really dramatic claims about the potential of new technologies to transform educational systems. Um, so in 2009, uh, the late Harvard Business School professor, Clay Christensen, wrote a book called Disrupting Class. He argued that by 2019 in the United States, half of all six through 12 courses would be taught online, that they would cost a third as much to provision, and that they would have better learning outcomes um, than typical high school classes. Um, at the very beginning of MOOC mania in 2012, Sebastian Thrun, the founder of Udacity, said that in 50 years, there'll only be 10 institutions in the world delivering higher education. There might be smaller regional places um, that are sort of facilitating students, but there really only be a handful of places creating courses, and Udacity has a shot to be one of them. Um, Sal Khan, in 2011, the founder of Khan Academy uh, uh, gave a, a TED talk watched by millions of people about using video to reinvent education. The idea was um, you could have students uh, sit down in front of their laptops, watch a series of videos, do some practice problems, learn at an individual pace, and then teachers might come around and gather those students and have them do projects or remediation or things like that. But students would basically be able to, to learn on their own pace at their own time. Um, and then I don't know if folks remember uh, Sugata Mitra um, from Newcastle University won the 2013 TED Prize. I mean, in some ways, he went further than any of these folks and said, uh, we don't even need to have schools or institutions um, that uh, um, actually, if you just give kids laptops, they can learn anything uh, by themselves. And as we've all seen over the last 18 months, these dramatic claims were really put to the test. Um, you know, from the beginning of the pandemic, maybe as many as 1.6, 1.7 billion learners um, have had their schooling interrupted, have participated in some form of remote or distance learning um, by, uh, by radio, by uh, laptop, by internet, by paper packet, all these different kinds of things. Um, and I think most parents could tell you that uh, you can't simply give kids a laptop connected to the internet and have them learn anything by themselves. Um, that for the vast majority of learners, online learning has been something between, uh, you know, remote emergency online learning has been something between disappointing and disastrous. Um, you know, in some ways, the claim of education technology evangelists was that new emerging technologies were going to create an educational infrastructure that was better than the typical system of schooling that we have in higher education and in K-12. Um, and in fact, what we saw um, is that, you know, new technologies faced a sort of smaller challenge than that. They had to only be better than a pandemic hobbled kind of system. Um, and for the most part, they were not particularly successful. Um, in particular, the role of new technologies, emerging technologies during the pandemic was somewhat muted. The two dominant technologies of the pandemic are actually two of our very oldest technologies. Now, you know, I obviously, um, there, there's just, you know, beginning to be emerging data around this. Um, so it's probably still more of a hunch than, than a definitive claim. But I think there are basically two technologies um, that have defined the experience of educators during the pandemic. The first are learning management systems, things like Canvas and Google Classroom, Schoolology. You know, learning management systems basically operate, you know, my, my elementary school kids have a folder in their backpack and one side says to home and one side says to school. They're basically you know, mechanisms for passing documents back and forth between teachers and students. They do a few other things, but that's the main one. Um, 
And then the second dominant technology of the pandemic, uh, when it was introduced in the 1930s, it was called video telephony. Um, you know, things like what Zoom we're using now, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts. Um, and nominally, what it lets you do is have a group of people be in the same digital space, take turns talking, seeing each other and so forth. Um, and, you know, for those of you who have been instructors, you know that teaching through Zoom is a little bit like teaching through a keyhole. You can sort of, with some awkward straining, see what's happening on the other side, but it's not really conducive to the same kind of meaningful interaction as being together. Um, so that, you know, it was not massive open online courses or learning analytics or artificial intelligence, you know, to a limited degree, maybe some adaptive tutors certainly got more use. Um, but our, our educational systems, uh, for the most part, didn't see this as a moment of profound transformation. In fact, the response to the pandemic in some respects was very, very conservative. I mean, the kind of paradox of pandemic schooling is that teachers and educators went through extraordinary efforts to transform their classrooms and schools, but they kind of transformed them into this sort of kabuki theater version of exactly what we had before. You know, in higher education, most faculty members walked away from their uh, lecture hall lecterns, they sat down in front of their home office webcams, and using LMS and video conferencing, they taught largely the way they had been teaching before. Um, we will not in our lifetimes see a more profound illustration of the conservatism of educational systems um, than what we saw during this very tumultuous period. Um, the, in a sense, the pandemic validated two of the most common findings in the history of education technology. If you review you know, the past 40 or 50 years of digital technology, if you review the past century, you know, going back to film and radio and so forth, you'll find these two themes over and over again. Um, and the first is that when teachers get access to new technologies, they use them to extend existing systems. New technologies don't disrupt educational systems. New technologies get domesticated by educational systems. And there, of course, always are pockets of innovation, but those pockets of innovation tend to disproportionately benefit uh, the most affluent learners in systems um, who tend to have the financial and social and technical resources to take advantage of new innovations. Um, there are some folks who were education technology evangelists who even in advance of the pandemic started noticing some of these tensions. Um, millions of people have watched Sal Khan's TED Talks. Far, far fewer have read his January 2019 interview in District Administration Magazine. This is a tiny little trade publication for school superintendents and head teachers and things like that. Um, in between starting Khan Academy uh, and more recently, Sal Khan also founded a school called the Khan Lab School. It's a private school in the San Francisco Bay Area and they charge whatever it is, $25,000 or $30,000 a year for students to go to the school. Um, and it was meant to be the sort of test bed of his ideas about transforming education. And he says, now that I run a school, I see that some of this stuff is not as easy to accomplish compared to how it sounds theoretically. Um, it's taken us a while to realize this, but it's actually quite hard um, to transform schools. More recently, we're seeing that if students put 30 minutes to an hour per week, about one class period a week, towards software-based self-paced learning, schools will see a 20 to 30% better than expected gain on state assessment. So he sort of saw kind of went from, we're gonna completely rearrange, we're gonna use video to transform education, we're gonna have individual children following their own paths, teachers collecting groups, doing projects. He went from that to, well, actually, let's just teach the way we've been teaching four days a week, and then one day a week have students do online practice problems. Now, one of the things about that insight is that it's actually quite old. Um, so you could go back, for instance, to 1997 and read Ken Katinger um, and colleagues, uh, Intelligent Tutoring Comes to the Big City. Um, where they basically did the same thing in Pittsburgh, you know, uh, 25 years ago. Uh, they brought computers with uh, adaptive tutors into schools. They tried to get teachers to teach a normal way three days a week and then do practice problems two days a week. The teachers, for the most part, would only do about one day a week. And they saw similar kinds of results, you know, non-trivial results, things that are beneficial to students, but also not transformations of the education system. Um, so part of what I try to argue in failure to disrupt 
is that there are two pretty common stances that people take towards education technology, uh, maybe three, I'll, I'll focus on two of them. Um, the first, and I borrow these terms from my colleague, uh, Morgan Ames, uh, who's in the University of California system, wrote a great book about one laptop per child called the Charisma Machine. Um, and she defines a stance towards education technology. One of them is the charismatic stance. This is kind of SalCon 2011, that technology disrupts and transforms existing systems. That the if you want to imagine the future, the future will be new and different because of new technologies. Another stance, um, we might call the tinkering stance. And this is what SalCon circa 2019 sounds a lot more like. Um, that new technologies don't disrupt uh, educational systems, they get domesticated by educational systems. So if you want to understand the future, you need to think of it as an extension of trends from history. If you want to know how millions and millions of uh, faculty and teachers around the world will adapt to remote learning, um, the, the main question to ask is something like, how can they use technology to do a form of schooling as close as possible to what they were doing before? Um, if you had asked yourself that question in February of 2020, that would have been a pretty good guide to figuring out what the pandemic might look like. Um, there were really kind of two key errors that charismatic technologists, that uh, education technology evangelists made when they were thinking about the pandemic. Um, when you hear charismatic folks with a charismatic stance describe new technologies, they often describe them as kind of all purpose as they're capable of transforming whole systems. Um, but our technologies are actually pretty specific. They're like distinct pegs in a vast schooling landscape of differently shaped holes. We have pretty good adaptive tutors for learning math. We have adaptive tutors that don't seem to work very well for teaching reading. And then we really don't have adaptive tutors in science and social studies for the most part. Um, things are specific and the work of schooling is incredibly granular. We ask schools to teach people how to factor polynomials, how to tie their shoes, um, how to not have sex or how to have sex in safe ways, how to critique their governments, how to be patriotic, uh, you know, how to uh, read a novel, how to uh, conjugate verbs in Spanish. We ask schools to do all these kinds of things and technologies are only good at some of them. Um, and learning technologies are not a switch that you can flip on. Um, they're only as effective as the communities that support their use. Um, one of the things that we saw at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, especially in K-12 schools, was teachers sending uh, their students home with you know, three or four different apps that they wanted them to use. Um, and so if you had six or seven classes in a middle school, a secondary school, a high school, you all of a sudden had you know, 24 different technologies you were supposed to manage. Um, and parents said, no, this is too many. We can't keep track of all these passwords. We can't keep track of all these usernames. I actually couldn't use all those technologies until families developed mechanisms for being able to integrate them into their routines of home learning. Um, so if you think that a key feature of educational systems is their conservatism, is their ability to domesticate new technologies rather than have new technologies be disrupted, then when you see a new technology, one of the most important questions you can ask is what's really new here? Um, learning scientists and computer scientists have partnered with each other to help create software where computers try to teach people from at, for as long as we've had computers. This, this is a 60 year project in the world from the very earliest days when computers are mainframes the size of your living rooms, People have been trying to create new technologies um, to be able to help humans learn. Um, as a result, when people create new things, they aren't making something which is dramatically new, which has never been imagined before. They're almost always adapting, usually in some modest way, something that's come before. So one of the, you know, if one of the most useful dispositions you can develop in evaluating new technologies and imagining how they could incrementally in a tinkering kind of way um, improve uh, educational systems is to say, well, what's kind of the new piece here? So if you wanna think about what's new, it's helpful to think about what comes before um, and the first half of failure to disrupt. 
try, sort of traces the history of three genres of education technology, um, in particular technologies for learning at scale, learning environments with many, many learners and few experts to guide them. And these three genres follow from the question, who guides the sequence of learning activities um, in a system? And there's basically three answers. There are things like massive open online courses and other kinds of self-paced courses where the instructor guides the sequence of learning activities. There are things like uh, adaptive tutors, cognitive tutors, algorithm guided education, where computers pose problems to students, uh, students respond to those problems, the algorithm evaluates the correctness of those problems and, and with more sophisticated ones where the errors might be, and then suggests you know, a harder problem or an easier problem or a remedial activity. That's algorithm guided learning at scale. Um, and then um, there's a third kind of online learning environment where a group of peers come together and they create sequences of learning activities for each other. This would be like the Scratch programming community or some of the original connectivist MOOCs that came out of Canada in 2008. Um, each of these three genres of learning technology has a set of, for the most part, pretty common features. Um, so to a first approximation, there's basically two kinds of pedagogies that we have for thinking about how people learn. Um, in the United States in the 20th century, we had these two educationists, Edward Thorndike and John Dewey, and they sort of echo uh, Plutarch's claim um, that education is not the filling of a pail, um, but the kindling of a flame. And Edward Thorndike said, no, 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 education is the filling of a pail, and we can measure how big people's buckets are, and we can measure how good teachers are at pouring information in those buckets. And then John Dewey was an educator who said, no, 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 um, education is not preparation for life, it's life itself, it's, uh, you know, apprenticeship, it's project-based learning, those kinds of things. Um, for the most part, each of these genres um, of instructor-guided, algorithm-guided, peer-guided learning at scale has adapted one of those uh, pedagogical frameworks. So for instructor guided learning at scale, those learning environments, they tend to be teacher centered directed instruction and the technologies behind them tend to be pretty familiar as well. Um, MOOCs are basically a learning management system with an auto grader put on top. Um, and our auto graders are okay, but they're pretty limited. Um, they're good at measuring things like math problems and computer programs and other things with right answers. And they're not so good at uh, evaluating open-ended responses. Algorithm-guided learning at scale also has this kind of instructionist pedagogy. Um, almost all of it operates using a relatively straightforward uh, set of statistical tools called item response theory. You know, there are a few variations like Bayesian knowledge tracing and some things like that, but it's basically the same sort of family of stuff. Um, and then peer guided learning at scale, uh, these environments tend to be more inspired by progressive, Dewey, um, you know, uh, project-based collaborative learning models, um, and their technologies tend to be something on the open web and then some kind of aggregator that pulls things together. So when you see new technologies, you can look at them and say, all right, well, which of these three categories does this seem to fit in best? And for each of these three categories, we actually have a fair amount of research that gives us some good guesses about how things will perform. You know, we saw a couple of glimpses of research about algorithm guided tutor, uh, uh, learning at scale, where in, in some subjects like math, it tends to help a little bit if it's used as a supplement to the curriculum. Um, for instructor guided learning at scale, massive open online courses, they seem to be really powerful learning experiences for people who are really good at self-paced independent learning. They tend to work not very well at all for folks who are not good at self-paced independent learning. It turns out that the way to get good at self-paced independent learning, it, for the most part, is a really good apprenticeship in the formal educational system. Um, so MOOCs are really good for people who are already educated, usually already affluent. Um, peer guided learning at scale, this sort of series of kind of what appear to be quirkier technologies that, that have a less easy fit with our existing educational systems. There tend to be people who really get excited them, have deep, powerful learning experiences in them. Um, and then most people find them really confusing, um, find the, the values and virtues of peer guided collaborative learning just sort of doesn't mesh um, with our focus on individual assessment inside schools. So if you know something um, about each of these genres of large-scale learning technologies, when a new thing comes along, you can say, oh, 
um, you know, this is not uh, this is not a, a, a brand new vehicle here, even though it might look shiny and different on the outside. You know, if you pop open the hood, like, oh, I recognize one of these engines. This is this is the same internal combustion engine we've been using for a long time. Um, so um, I think this sort of tinkering disposition, this idea that we should be able to look at new technologies, see where they come from in the past, see how we might be able to use them in incremental ongoing ways to improve educational systems um, is I think the most productive way of thinking about the use of technology um, in schools and in higher education. Um, and if you believe that, you should also think about what are some of the obstacles? What are the reasons why these sort of transformative visions of new technologies don't come through? Um, you know, and I think that there are basically kind of three kinds of challenges um, that school systems run into over and over again um, when they try to integrate new technologies. Um, the first is that learning uh, systems are unbelievably complex. They're extremely granular. Um, they have many, many goals and many competing stakeholders. Our technologies are uneven, so they work well in some subjects for some students in some contexts and not as well for other students in other subjects and other contexts. Um, and certainly in the United States, but I think in lots of places in the world, our education systems are really inequitable, um, that we provide lots and lots of resources to our most affluent, um, most uh, oftentimes, you know, who become then our, our, mo our most facile students at learning. Um, and it's much harder to figure out how you use new technologies to support the students uh, who we often believe uh, deserve the most additional support. So these kind of fall then into what I call four as yet intractable dilemmas. So if you're an education researcher, an education technology developer, someone who's implementing education technology in schools, I think these are four problems that you will run into over and over again um, that very smart people have spent a lot of time figuring out. Um, but if you want to tinker better, if you want to use technologies to continuously improve the, the schools that you work in, these are going to be the problems that you're going to face over and over again. Um, the first of them is the curse of the familiar. Um, and this is the idea um, that schools are good at adopting technologies that do the kinds of things that schools are doing anyway. Um, when you, so, you know, if you're an education technology developer, you could take a technology um, and try to digitize some existing practice in schools. Um, in the United States, one of the most popular education technologies is called Quizlet. Um, and it basically lets you make online flashcards. If we brought a bunch of education experts together um, and said, what are the real problems that our education systems are facing? My guess is no one would raise their hand and say, you know what, we've got a real dearth of flashcards in our schools. You know, there are not enough index cards to go around. We're really going to make sure that, that we get enough uh, flashcards. Um, but the reason why Quizlet is so widely adopted is that, you know, as soon as you look at that software, you know exactly what it's doing. Everyone knows what flashcards are. They're all over our educational system. And so, you know, we can gain some small efficiencies by digitizing them. And it gets widely, widely used. Um, so we can make technologies that are recognizable to education systems, but if you're just digitizing existing practices, it's unlikely to get huge learning gains from those practices. By contrast, when we make really new kinds of things, you know, the scratch programming language for collaboratively learning creative computing um, or Desmos's uh, graphing calculator that lets uh, math learners do all kinds of mathematical modeling, visualizing what they're doing. When you bring these really new sort of exciting things into schools, a lot of times teachers and students don't know what to do with them. Um, if you make something that's really new and might help people learn in really different ways that might be much better, um, it's hard for them to learn those different ways. So that's one of the challenges that technology designers at schools face, this kind of curse of the familiar. Um, a second challenge is what I call the EdTech Matthew effect, which I've alluded to before, you know, which is basically we often hope that what education technology does is, you know, the, the panel on the right here, um, that over time, new technologies will disproportionately benefit uh, low income learners. But the reality is, as we observe in cases over and over again, um, most, you know, lots of people can benefit from new technologies. There's always, you know, when, when massive open online courses came out, there are these incredible stories of individual learners from the most remote corners of the world doing incredible learning. Um, 
But by the same token, sort of what we've learned is that for the most part, um, new technologies benefit affluent learners who have the financial, social, and technical capital to take advantage of new innovations. Um, there are certainly cases of new technologies which are, are designed usually by thoughtful folks, um, usually by folks from diverse backgrounds so from the very beginning to target um, some of the, the challenges that low-income learners face. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, new technologies tend to exacerbate the inequalities rather than close them. Um, if you wanted to make education uh, more just wherever you live, it's probably more a matter of politics, of social organizing, of movements, than it is a matter of creating new technologies or implementing them. Um, a third challenge which pervades new technologies, I call the trap of routine assessment. For learners to get better, they have to know how they're doing. And some technology systems like you know, algorithm-guided adaptive tutors, they depend on evaluating students to figure out what they should do next. Um, our auto graders only work in certain subjects and parts of certain subjects. Um, in particular, computers are good at assessing things that are routine, things that have clear right and wrong answers, things that can be broken down into discrete pieces. They're basically good at evaluating the kinds of things that computers are good at doing. The problem is what we really need humans to learn is all of the stuff that, that computers are not good at learning. Um, we need students to be good at reasoning from evidence and explaining that reasoning from evidence, you know, in oral language, in written language, those kinds of things. Um, you know, if, as we look at studies of what kind of work exists for people in the future, you know, the two dominant uh, skills that people need are complex communication um, and critical thinking or ill-structured problem solving. Um, we don't have auto graders that are good at evaluating reasoning from evidence. Reasoning from evidence is maybe the most important thing that we teach in higher education and K-12 education. So there's a sort of mismatch um, where there's a surge of new auto grading tools that we have, but they're not really covering the very most important parts of our curriculum. You know, they have some role to play in math and computer science um, and a, maybe a couple of other subjects. But, uh, but there's also major gaps in what they're able to do. And those gaps are, are not there. Um, they're not for lack of trying. There are many, many smart people with millions and millions of dollars, with government funding, with philanthropic funding, um, with huge sources of data from online learning, from standardized testing companies, things like that. This is just a really hard problem to solve. Um, a final challenge that education technology design designers, tinkerers face um, is what I call the toxic power of data and experiment. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, when you go to commercial technology platforms, the way that they're always getting better is by running little tests on you all the time. So every time you go to Amazon or Google, maybe not every time, but once every hundred times you go, um, you're being exposed to some little test. Will you buy more if they make the buy button red versus blue? Um, it's possible to do that kind of experimentation in online learning environments. It turns out, however, that if you talk to parents um, and ask them what they think of education technology researchers experimenting with their children, that they're not that enthusiastic about that idea. The other problem um, is that conducting these experiments, um, conducting research in online learning platforms, usually requires um, collecting vast amounts of data about the students passing through these systems. Well, collecting vast amounts of data from students participating in public education um, raises all kinds of concerns about surveillance and privacy. Um, in education, we teach from what we do as much as from what we say, um, and we don't want to be creating educational systems that prepare young people for life in a surveillance state. Um, so there are really powerful kinds of things that we can do with data and experiments to improve education technology systems, um, but there are some real limits and concerns um, there as well. So those four challenges, um, the curse of the familiar, the EdTech Matthew effect, the trap of routine assessment, the toxic power of data and assessment, um, those are four of the main challenges that those of us who are interested in education technology face. Um, 
you know, maybe one thing that sort of unites all of these challenges um, is it's not just about making technologies that work better, making technologies that teach better, making technologies that are easier to use. Um, our technologies are only as powerful as the communities that guide their use. Um, a key way of understanding the tinkering mindset of continuous improvement in education technology is recognizing that it's, it's not about downloading the right software on the right computers. It's really about supporting a whole ecosystem of teachers, of students, of families, of systems that are continuously finding more thoughtful ways of helping uh, new technologies improve the work of teaching and learning, um, staying away from the kind of boom and bust hype cycles uh, that the charismatic tech technologists offer um, and recognizing that improving human development is an incredibly complex and challenging problem. Um, and it's not going to be one that we disrupt or step change our way out of. It's going to be one that we continuously work at. Um, and, uh, you know, if if you believe in that model of human development of kind of, you know, two steps back for every three steps forward, um, then, then that might be a challenging message to hear, but it's also probably as good as it gets.